Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tech Anarchy. It's freezing here in Dallas, Fort Worth. I am your host, Tim Harris. And with me is my co host, Jennifer Ruggiero. And it is pretty chilly here at 33 degrees. Um, thanks for the welcome, Tim. Uh, we have icy, freezing rain right now, but I heard that you guys have had snow for the past couple of days, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, in North Texas, they had they they are having snow, and uh, actually, where I am, uh, the weather forecast should have been sheet of ice because that's pretty much all that there is outside. I've been stuck in the house for at least three and a half days. Oh my god! And yeah, uh, half is... half million people are without power in the Dallas area, and it's pretty wild. Oh, that's horrible. Um, have you lost power? Are you pretty secure where you are? Do you have internet, power, we're, water? We're secure. We are, and we have water. Um, we have all the essentials. The neighborhood that we're in is relatively new, so we get the luxury of having all the newest power lines and everything. Even though they are overhead, they're not underground. That's too expensive. But uh, we're, we're definitely one... We're definitely benefiting from, from you know, the newness of the neighborhood. Oh, wow. I remember when I first moved into the neighborhood I lived in now, there was an ice storm the first winter. And I was like, the probably I think I was the first person in this building. And uh, the homes behind me weren't built yet. It was like right when it first opened. And uh, they, they, the geniuses that built these homes put this... Oh, I forgot. It was like a hydro something heater up in the attic. And so what it would do, it would blow water through the pipes and, and air over the pipes to make the heat. And we had a nice storm. It froze water down the walls. I mean, it, disaster one had to come out. It was just horrible. I mean, Wait, this and I was, was inside so, your house. It was inside the house because they put the stupid hydro heater system in the attic and not thinking, oh, well, we live in North Carolina. There's a chance that there's, this might freeze. And uh, it was the, uh, idiotic builders. Kavanaugh. Wow. Sending well, out there. Kavanaugh. Which <laughs> you probably don't have Kavanaugh homes where you are. So. <laughs> no, no, actually. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not familiar with the name, but that I think that's the biggest problem that today's weather patterns are presenting or, you know, is 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 the the randomness of the weather and just based on certain building standards for the region it's just it's just they're just wrong i mean the houses that are being built today are being built cheaply and not really with weather in mind i mean we are in a tornado hot zone yet there are no basements um but we do have uh, steel construction instead of wood frame for the frame of our house. So that's great, you know. But uh, but other than that, you know, we're pretty much left vulnerable to the elements. And ice is no exception. Uh, just where I am, I I literally I can step outside and from my door to the mailbox, which is at least a, a you know a, maybe. I don't know, maybe, you know, 10th of a mile, whatever, um, is all one sheet of ice. Oh is one sheet, one continuous sheet of ice. I could slide to my mailbox if I wanted to. So, um, so you can imagine what the roads are like. Okay. And I think that's the biggest problem in the DFW area is that just in this area alone, we have about 8 million people. And so we need for, for the highways to be uh, working or functional in order to get from point A to point B. I mean, I live in a kind of a farming community and, um, you know, we're lucky to have a Walmart down the street, but, but the road that separates me from the Walmart is, uh, not sanded. It's, it's a farm road. So 
Um, it's not really taken care of. Uh, so you're pretty and stuck. That's yeah, sad. we're stuck. Yeah. Well, hopefully, when when are, when are we supposed to see some warmer weather uh, for you? So you'll be able. Well, to that's the problem. Is that warm weather is supposed to happen at four o'clock today, and it's supposed to be above freezing for only three hours. Mm. But then it's going to freeze back. It'll be freeze back up yeah. again. Yep. Yeah, and it's going to be like that for for a few days. So I really don't know how I'm gonna. I don't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of the house for another few days. We're running out of food, so there's definitely going to have to be a food run. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's it's all crazy, and I I don't know. Are are you guys in North Carolina more prepared for ice than we are here in Texas? Mm, probably not. We we do salt the roads, and they've gotten a lot better in the past few years than what it used to be. It used to be, you know, where it's just you wouldn't be able to make it out, or I don't know. North, North Carolina also is known for overreacting when it comes to snow. So if mm. there is even the threat of snow, uh, schools have been known to shut down and announce that they'll be closed the night before. And yeah. so it's, it's interesting. So, you know, I think kind of also along those lines, I think everyone enjoys in North Carolina when there is a threat of snow and when we do have snow days because it's kind of like a holiday. And so uh, I think everyone kind of likes it. But no, it's they're, they're prepared. I mean, they're I mean, it's I, I tend to, you know, already have what I need and never really had to try to get out. There was one time back when I worked at the radio station where you had to go into work no matter what and we actually had like considerable ice and snow and and we had it, it took about what's typically a 15 minute drive it took about you know 90 minutes to get to work so yeah, yeah. it took me two two and a half hours to get home um thursday night oh, wow. and I, I drive an electric car and so the most difficult situation for me was the fact that I couldn't use energy for my defrost defroster because I use all of my energy to commute and so about you know right when the sun set uh, the ice started forming on my windshield and so I was frantically you know enabling the defroster for about five seconds and then turning it off and then i had the the wipers go in at full blast but unfortunately that didn't help i mean once it drops under 28 degrees it just everything begins to freeze and uh it, it 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 seemed like even the water vapor was freezing to my car and so my windshield just became this thick layer of ice and lucky for me my wife was following me so um so if you yeah. did stall then you you know you yeah could exactly have someone and she could help you out That's i was good. real close real good. close i mean it, it, after after you know when you have about five miles of charge left on your vehicle oh uh, everything kind of blacks out and you you don't see how much charge you have left so you're kind of winging it at that point in time but uh yeah it was it was interesting and oh, lesson learned i will <laughs> never drive ice roads with an ev if i have to go more than 10 miles no God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking about ice, and you know, later today we'll be talking about some storm preparedness tips, um, which I think is very relevant to what's happening right now. Extremely relevant. And here in Texas, we have ice normally in January and February, and even March, early March. But you know, I read Farmer's Almanac, which we kind of cover later on in the episode, and they're pretty much predicting that we're going to be having ice every weekend like this. So I'm, I'm thinking about getting ready for, oh, yeah. for a very being long winter. Prepared, yeah. So being prepared is definitely a theme theme of the show. But but first we have some news to cover. So are you ready? I am ready. All right. First. First off, we have the FBI's search for a Mo. I guess that's his that's his alias Mo, uh, who was suspected in bomb threats, and uh, they ended up using malware to serve to conduct surveillance on his machine. And I think I think this is 
really interesting that it's the FBI that's that's doing the malware creation and not the NSA. Because uh, as we all learned from the past, the NSA kind of created the malware responsible for the Iran nuclear facility. I, I, I forgot. I forgot the title of the the virus that they wrote, but. Now we learn that the FBI has its own elite hacker team who is designing malware for domestic computers. So but what are they I, doing with this malware? Are they just using it as a way to spy on on folks? Or Well, it's pretty bad. They're, they are using the malware to actually trigger the camera, and they can make it to where your camera is eavesdropping on citizens without you even being aware that the camera is turned on. So the light doesn't go on. The light does not go on. That's oh, that's correct. creepy. Yeah, there. You know, as a as a former uh, network security guy, I can also tell you that there are files in like if you have a MacBook of any type, there are files in your operating system that you cannot delete. Yeah. Um, the the NSA had a hand in writing the kernel for Linux, uh, secure Linux. Um, and they also had a hand in helping to secure Windows 7, Windows 8, and I'm sure OS 10. So they kind of have their hands in everything, but now that the FBI is writing their own malware, malware t- tools, that kind of tells me that the domestic side of things is more, um, more active than I thought it would be. Uh, how exactly how exactly this is used in the court of law mm-hmm. that that I believe is going to be the biggest issue. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say is how is this going to be used? If it's going to be used to spy on potential criminals or people that, you know, they really need to monitor then you know, and that's good in my opinion, but at the same time is that that's also a violation as well, you know, I mean, unless if that person I guess has a proven tr- history of doing wrong and being, I, I don't know. So when, when is it crossing the line? I think anything like this is kind of crossing the line and, you know, I, even me, and I, I don't think that anyone is stalking me or at all, but on my work computer, I have the uh, masking tape over the camera just in case the ca- right. <laughs> just in case the camera pops on, you know? And, uh, I, you know, so I don't know. I think a lot of people probably do that. Um, is put some tape over their camera. Right. Black, black tape is, I mean, but you even have the audio, audio in your equipment that you have to be careful of too. Yeah. And like we discussed in a previous episode, you have the connect, which has an audio feature. And in the newest Xbox one, the connect is always, always on. on. And same with my which Moto means, X. It's always right, on. Which, which means that the audio is always on as yeah. well. Yeah. So that's that's one thing that we have to be careful of. I, I'm going to have to drum up the, the quote, but uh, there was a quote on Meet the Press where they were talking about the iPhone and or not necessarily the iPhone, but pretty much every smartphone and surveillance. And they were interviewing a senator and the senator candidly says that, uh, well, you, you have to plug your cell phone into a charger, don't you? And and the show host says yes, and he says, "Well, you're being watched." So that that to me is huh. interesting. I had heard ways the NSA is kind of um, doing surveillance through electrical outlets. So anything which is required to be powered can also be monitored at the same time. Wow. So you know there there are ways to beat the system, even if you put tape over your camera and um, turn off the off switch to your uh, cell phone. That is pretty creepy. That's right. Uh, yeah. But this online surveillance, apparently, according to Washington Post, is is pushing the boundary of of the Constitution. Uh, unlimited search and seizure, which I believe the the Constitution protects. However, our users should also be aware that we are in a war currently, which kind of means they, you know, government can do anything domestically. So it'd be interesting to see how that all plays out in the courts. 
Yeah, it will be very yeah. interesting. Um, great. Just, just, just on a side note, though, Mo was using his Yahoo email account when he got this malware that the FBI crafted. Yeah. Did but he, it doesn't I'm, say whether or not he actually opened anything, right? He was just checking his email and it came through? Right. He checked his Yahoo email account, but we all know that the Yahoo and Yahoo and NSA who probably gave NSA probably gave the FBI access to most Yahoo email account, which mm-hmm. is probably what happened. Mm-hmm. They wrote the malware, uh, but I, I'm assuming because the email account was mentioned in the article that this was how the malware was delivered. But at the same time, you had, you know, last episode, we talked about EULA and being very cautious as to what you check right. when you. With the whole LG TV spying exactly. on you, listening to you. Mm-hmm. Well, this is no different because Yahoo makes you sign a EULA prior to activating yeah. uh, your email service. So, you know, this, this EULA probably will be used in the court case and, you know, nothing can be done. But at the same time, this Mo guy ended up being a pretty shady individual who, in my mind, needed to be caught. So, um, so good that they caught him. I mean, it's especially when it's when it's people that are just had complete terrible criminals that are just doing horrible thing things. They definitely need to be caught. So, I mean, I don't know. It's 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 a huge it, privacy issue. But then at the same yeah. time, it's you know. It would just make me comfortable if the FBI received a, a warrant, a search warrant for this for this individual's email account. Um, but actually, crafting the malware is offensive in nature, and it's not defensive. So, it's it would almost be a form of entrapment, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, along those same lines, um, but not as invasive. <laughs> There's, I have a story, mm-hmm. and this is about the Android app. It's an Android app called Brightest Flashlight that has over 50 million downloads. It would send user location and device data to advertisers. And the thing about this app is that it um, wouldn't tell anyone that it was sending this information. Um, it was released in February 2012, and since then has been um, downloaded many, many times, of course. And you know, when consumers are giving a given a real choice, they'll they'll probably, if it's in plain English, opt out of sharing their data. Um, but in this case, you know, it was uh, sharing their, their data, sharing their their location. And, you know, and it's not a huge thing is, you know, when you get an ad, that, an advertisement that's catered towards where you are and, and what you're doing. And, you know, I guess it's, um, it's not such a bad thing, but it's just the fact that they needed to be upfront with, the um, with the consumers, right? So the FTC is has um, opened up a case against them, and uh, so we'll see what happens. It's um, actually it says right here <laughs> in a yeah. settlement with the FTC, the maker of Brightest Flashlight Free admitted that the app's privacy policy deceptively failed to disclose that it was passing on location and device ID data. So. Um, you know what's disconcerting to me is the fact that they settled, and this info and you know it, what you just read is a prepared statement for the settlement. But had we actually had a court case, we probably would have discovered more nefarious things going on here. Yeah, and yeah. that that bothers me that there was a settlement because I'm reading your article and I see that device IDs were passed to advertisers. And mm-hmm. that yeah, device IDs as well, right? Right. Mm-hmm. That's an issue to me because that allows advertisers to create malware or spyware for the devices and deliver the payload without your consent. Wow. And wow. that's probably that's the only reason why you would want to keep the device ID. That's and just also so everyone knows, this is quoted. This article is in the Guardian. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, uh, list where the news was coming from, but 
yeah. I think I think it's obvious that these two articles that we're going over came from the Guardian and Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> And, so you know, and here's the thing: it's you know, I know in the Android market, there's just a lot of things that pass that that get through the cracks. That uh, you know, pretty much anything can be approved to go in the Android market or Google Play. I'm sorry, Google Play, and uh, it's really disconcerting that it's um, you know that there's dangerous apps out there. You know, and people right. usually say just don't download a third party app from a from a vendor that you don't know who it is or you know, don't check that button on your Android device, but, but, you know, when it comes directly from play and so many people have downloaded it, it's very deceptive and this kind of stuff right. just needs to stop. Yeah. Apparently Golden Shores Technologies is the company responsible for writing this brightest flashlight app. That's and right. they also write a color app, apparently, which does the same thing. I mean, when I say malware, that can be anything from uh, key loggers all the way to just uh, a system to deliver ads that, you know, you don't approve of or don't improve the uh, distribution of. So malware can be this huge spectrum of um, obtrusive or intrusive elements Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you. But yeah, the, the fact that they collect device IDs tells me something else is going on and the settlement does not make me feel comfortable. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So it's, um, this is interesting. Um, in October, three security researchers from Bitdefender examined 630,000 apps in Google Play and more than 23% of them, not 23%, 23,000, I'm sorry, grabbed the user's email address. So that's interesting. Yeah. They also highlighted that the brightest flashlight free for, um, the, uh, for displaying a fake antivirus warning, which suggested that the user's phone harbored malware. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, Gosh, those guys, jerks. <laughs> You know, I, I wouldn't have a problem with this if the phone company uh, paid me to use their phone. You know, they can pay me if they want to do surveillance on me. But I have to spend so much money on these smartphones to be to be spied on. That just doesn't make sense. I mean, companies are supposed to pay me if they want to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I get there's what do I get out of this? Nothing. I just, I get data stolen from me. <laughs> uh, it's so backwards. <laughs> exactly. It really is. And you know what um, is interesting? Did I just, this thing is still in the app store. This app is compatible with some of your devices. I'm looking at this right now. Um, yeah. It's in the app store still. They settled. I mean, so I guess they updated it. And so now... You know, they're getting all this publicity as well. Um, but yeah. here's like some some ratings on here. Somebody said, one, one star, do not download. This app is selling users' private data to third-party advertisers. Right. Um, here's another one that gave it five stars. Uh, so let me see. So uh, out of all the stars, it has 4.8 stars out of five. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, right? I, I'm sure. I'm sure the PR department is in full swing. Wait, let me visit their website. Okay, I'm visiting yeah. their website right now. Oh, um, it's a great looking website. Oh, <laughs> gosh, the other. Website I'm being sarcastic. Is, is horrible. Yeah, I know you are. It's, uh, the last yeah. update, the copyright for the website was 2011. Oops. Oh, that's interesting. No. So they haven't updated the website in a while. Not at all. The last update was mm -hmm. March 8th, 2011. Do we know who discovered this 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 uh, intrusion? Oh, gosh. Let me see if the story says. I don't remember reading that. Um, um, no, I don't, it doesn't say. It does talk about the settlement that um, the guy who runs it, Eric Geidel, I believe his name is, or Geidel. Okay. Uh, 
has been ordered to delete any personal information that the app has collected. And he's also required to tell the FC, FTC if he changes his employment over the next 10 years. That doesn't seem like a, a good enough punishment for deceiving Unless... all these users and getting money from <clears throat> advertisers, you know. Unless you're a shell company for the CIA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this we, we don't even know who we don't even know who this was against. Mm-mm. That that's weird. This whole case is has been quashed. It's been silenced. All we're seeing is just the fallout. So maybe it is for something else, you know? It has to be. That's just bizarre. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah. I know flashlight apps were popular on the iPhone, so it's just inevitable that it, you know, they would be popular on Android so, devices. Yeah. But so why not create a one that steals your app? data? <laughs> yeah, and then and then so you create this little basic app, totally a basic <laughs> app. Yeah. And then at the same time, just collect everyone's data. That's sounds like a great app to me. Yeah. Let's get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in uh, in other news, <laughs> we have the FCC postponing Spectrum auction, uh, the Spectrum auction until 2015, mid 2015. That is, wow. It, yeah, and this was this auction was basically for for kind of the not the AT and T Verizon's of the world. In my mind, it was mostly for the Sprints or T Mobiles that wanted to add to their Spectrum portfolio, and. Um, it just, yeah, it just allowed them to add, but I think it's interesting that it was delayed, um, when it, you know, was supposed to be for next January and, um, yeah, it's supposed to be January, 2014, right? Right. But they delayed it till 2015. Um, this, this whole auction for the spectrum is a requirement, um, from, let's see, I'm looking it up. It's a requirement from a bill just passed by Congress. Yeah, Cong- yeah. so it's part of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act to auction off this spectrum. Does it um, say why it was postponed? No, it doesn't. But normally when I hear that things like this have been postponed, I'm thinking that lobbyists took someone to dinner. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that really... I'd like to see some other smaller cell phone carriers or some other ones to be able to get the spectrum that they want. And so that way it creates more competition and drives prices down, you know? So that's, that's a shame that we have to wait until 2015. Same goes for the cable companies. I want to see them. I want more competition there too. I just, (laughs) right, right. Exactly. Well, the, I was looking forward to this auction, um, for, for several reasons, one of which, you know, like we discussed in the past episode, my mother-in-law is still using dial-up, oh, but right. she has good, um, she, she can use Wi-Fi if, if she, you know, if she had a way of consuming it cheaply, but she doesn't want the, the cable, you know, package. Mm-hmm. Um, but if she had a data only option, which, you know, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi enabled networks like like a clear wire allow um then that would be a cheap alternative um now we we do have google who's installing their fiber in dallas uh, by 2015 and they just yeah they just purchased uh the rights to exclusively distribute uh, broadband at starbucks that's right i read about that yeah right so they are they are ready to own spectrum they already own a little bit of spectrum but this would also be good for a google too yeah uh, on the amazon side i don't know if you're familiar with this story but amazon apparently is creating drones mm-hmm. to deliver packages to your doorstep and they're saying they'll only take them 30 minutes i know it's awesome <laughs> you know i got i got a, a taste of this just recently because as our listeners know, I, I thanks to you, I was able to order my USB thumb drive from Amazon, mm-hmm. and then I also ordered a um, Skyfall Blu-ray. It was cheap, and next thing I know, 
my a package is at my doorstep the following day and i i asked for two-day delivery and instead i get like 16 hour delivery it's amazing isn't it i was amazed do you, so do you have an Amazon distribution plant near you, Jennifer? I think there's one in North Carolina. You know, I don't know if there is one near me, but I will say that a lot of times when I do order an item and it is for two-day delivery, I'll get it the next day. Uh, that's not all the time. I think it depends on where the item is coming out of and what facility that is. And I'm not uncertain. If there is one in North Carolina, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, and this whole thing about Amazon wanting to deliver within 30 minutes to homes and businesses that are nearby their facility via drones, I think that is just so cool. A little yeah. bit weird. A little bit weird. <laughs> it, it, you know, I mean, it makes me wonder about the future. Ten years from now, are we going to be seeing a lot of automated things flying in the air, a lot of automated drones doing this and that. And how is that going to affect, you know, other delivery people? But in this case, it's not replacing the delivery man. It's uh, because we don't offer anything like this right now. We don't have a 30 minute delivery, you know, it's not right. Except for pizza, you know, or Uh, something like that or food. Oh, that would be a great use of drones. Yeah. Even food. Well, the FAA is, it's interesting that you, said that because the FAA is currently working on drone safety and usage regulations, which will take effect in 2015. Mm -hmm. So buy your drones now (laughs) because (laughs) soon you'll be, you'll have to have a license to own a drone. And it's interesting just what the FAA or how the FAA is classifying the, the term drone or, you know, what what falls into that classification. Uh, the Air Drone, Air Drone 1.0, 2.0, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but it looks like a little hover hovercraft with four propellers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It has a camera on it. Yes. Yeah, well, you'll need a license to operate that. That's what they're considering a drone. Well, good. Yeah. Good. So yeah, no cameras, yeah. but I think small toy cameras, small toy helicopters you with mean cameras like my remote, on them. The remote that's control. right. Yeah, good. I think that will not fall under this. So my spy copter will. That's be fine. exactly right. Okay. Yeah, your spy copter will still be flyable. <laughs> I really want a spy copter. Well, it looks like you're you're still safe to operate one. <laughs> but but you know how how the FAA is going to monitor this. I, I, they're going to have to monitor everything that goes up in the air. They're going to have to create a brand new um, traffic control terminal for this stuff, mm-hmm. which means that we're going to have to have a safe and reliable way of tracking drones. But not not only that, but we're going to have to be afraid of hackers intercepting drones. We already know it's possible because Iranian hackers did the same thing to capture our own drone Fall, flying over their airspace. Yeah, so what's to stop some hackers from nothing. To pack into this? Absolutely right. nothing. All it, you need is a radio. And I'm wondering how sturdy these drones are to be able they, – they look awfully flimsy, you know? Right. I mean, couldn't a big gust of wind – would they go out – you know, take it away? Would they go out during a storm? Um, or yeah, ice. Yeah, or ice, snow. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's a great point, and apparently, you know, it, it said in in this article from Technology Review that this is more likely to be a, a niche, high cost service for high value items. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I don't I I don't know as as long as I. You know, airplanes can fly in some pretty turbulent weather, and our predator drones do as well in right. sandstorms. That's true. So I think it is possible. However, you know, I I just don't want to glaze over the security ramifications of all this stuff because, you know, we we found out earlier on, and it's why the F one seventeen was pretty much decommin- decommissioned, was because people were bringing down our our highly top secret stealth plans with cell phones. Hmm. So, you know, wow. We, wow. where there is will, there is a way, but normally, you know, considering the, the people that make these, these high tech instruments, um, to, at the lowest cost, there's always a way to, to either hack in or, or bring them down. And, um, you I- know, 
we'll see. Yeah. It's, I, I do find it interesting that, um, according to technology review, when they wrote why it matters, and I think this is a good point, delivering packages is expensive on traffic clogged city streets and difficult in rural areas. That, that's what they said. And mm. I, you know, I, that's something I never even thought of because I don't live in a rural area, nor do I live in a city. And, uh, you know, so for us, it's, it's easy for them to get around here and my UPS mm -hmm. guy and FedEx guy and are awesome. You know, my mailman on the other hand, uh, he's, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's great. You know, cause when you are in a, in a city, right. That's so the streets, it takes forever to get anywhere mm -hmm. and it's just, uh, very challenging to, to get around. So any well, yeah. rural areas too. Yeah. yeah. And to add to that, uh, that's the reason why I asked you about the fulfillment centers, because we actually have a new Amazon fulfillment center, not five miles away from us. Oh, how nice. So you so, might be one of the first cities to launch drones. Exactly. Exactly. You'll have to try it just, just for fun. Along the same lines of drones, this is really a neat time that we're living in. Um, according to That's CNET, an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, really. This, there's a uh, crime predicting robot that aims to patrol our streets by 2015. It's um, a California based company called Nightscope. They have design, I got it, developed, designed, I blended the two words together. I made a new word there. Um, and they have designed like a five foot tall, 300 pound autom automaton called the K5, and it is designed to combat crime and uh, provide some public safety. Um, and is so, this not a PR stunt from the RoboCop team? I mean, maybe we, are, it is. we have a new movie coming out soon, RoboCop, and I'm seeing all these weird kind of RoboCop-esque news lines. Yeah, and this does look kind of robocop -y, right? You um, might as well just call the company Skynet and just be done with it. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> So this kind of looks like a little R2-D2 guy, and, um, you know, they, they call it a friendly R2-D2 lookalike that will patrol the streets, school hallways, maybe some company campuses. No, 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 no. You lost me with school hallways. Please don't say that's going to be the case. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's what it says here in the story. Yeah, um, school hallways. So I somehow understand. it, it determines crime. Um, so it has nighttime video cameras, thermal imaging capabilities, license plate recognition, um, and it time will... travel capabilities. What's the, what did you say? Time travel time capabilities. Tra time travel. <laughs> time travel. I've seen Minority Report. I know where this goes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that whole thing. That's what I thought when I read this. I thought Minority Report. I was like, wow. Or Terminator. Yeah. Combine the two. Yep. Yeah, combine them both. Yeah, it's kind of weird. So it says it can hear, see, um, feel, and smell. I don't know how it can smell. And it will roam around autonomously 24-7. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. So at the moment, the, the K-5 is only a prototype. And uh, next year, they'll launch a beta program with select partners. So I guess we'll get a better look at it next year. Um, it uh, says that they're um, aiming to have the K-5 fully deployed by 2015 as a machine as a service business model, meaning clients would pay by the hour for a monthly bill. Uh, so 40 hour, 40 hour weeks of $1,000. So the hourly rate is only $6.25 an hour. That's that's fantastic, but you know, guess whose budget this is coming out of? And my wife being the teacher, I'm I'm sure it's going to come out of her salary. Yeah, unless it's to it, pay it, for this service. I think that they're looking to replace security guards with us. You know, there there are very little security guards in middle schools and elementary schools. Yeah, Mostly, see. they're in high schools. I can't think of any except for yeah, maybe some high schools and some some poor and some bad areas. Not poor areas, mm -hmm. but bad areas and. Um, you know, we're oh man, so now we're gonna look more like Elysium. It's <laughs> it's it's scary, right? It's kind of I don't know. It's scary and exciting and cool and creepy all in one. Yeah, that that to me is a very de definition of creepy. Yeah, 
So having, uh, you know, from, from drones to robots to autonomous vehicles, I, I mean, it's, I cannot wait to see the way our world will be 30 years from now. You know, here in Texas, we passed, we, we passed, there was a lawsuit against red light cameras and it was, it was found unconstitutional for the camera footage to be used against you in a court of law without a police officer being present to take the cam- the footage. Wow. Um, so yeah, so if you get a red light ticket, you don't need to pay for it and they can't criminally prosecute you for not doing so because it's against, it's, you know, not the the law states that (laughs) but at the same time you know with these robot automatons running around uh protecting people from crime it's going to eventually discover crime and so how exactly again is this footage going to be used in a court of law and that's what i'm wondering how they're going to how also will they capture unless if they're communicating this evidence to a nearby cop um, so it's interesting. It says that it has behavioral, behavioral analysis capabilities and enough camera audio and other sensor tech to pump out 90 terabytes of data a year per unit. And down the line, it will be equi- equipped with facial recognition and right. the ability to sniff out um, any chemical or bi- bi- biological weapons, um, mm-hmm. as well as airborne pathogens. It will be able to travel up to 18 miles per hour, and uh, later models will incru- include the ability to maneuver curbs in other terrain. That's pretty wow. fast, 18 miles per hour. Yeah. It's not going to be armed. So uh, we'll, Yet. We'll, <laughs> yet, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> In other news, we have a study which reveals that meditation actually is good for the body. Meditation is good for the body. I would agree with that, although I don't do it as nearly as often as I should. Well, they're suggesting eight hours. Eight hours of meditation? Yeah, eight hours of mindfulness practice. Uh, And I want to know who was able to do this study because it sounds very fun to just have nothing to do for eight hours. But. The meditators showed a range of genetic and molecular differences, including altered levels of gene regulating machinery and machinery and reduced levels of pro-inflammatory genes, which in turn correlated with faster physical recovery from a stressful situation. Hmm. So eight hours, I'm still stuck with the eight hours. Like what if it were, can we compromise and make it four? Can you even, I I have a hard time doing it for 20 minutes. I just... (laughs) It's, yeah, I want to know what 20 minutes does. I mean, eight hours. I mean, eight hours of doing nothing can do a lot. I mean, it changes. It's just like when you sleep and your body recovers and heals itself while it's sleeping, you know. Ooh, could we say sleep then? I mean, I'll, cons- I'll do eight hours of sleep, no no problem. But I, meditation, I, I really do have a hard time. It's like I, I was doing it regularly and now I, I don't. And even trying to do it for for just a measly 20 minutes is, is quite a challenge. I have so much mind chatter. It just, it's hard to quiet my mind. I don't know how so, they, people do it successfully. It's so I'm wondering practice, what the difference is between REM sleep and meditation. And I'm looking it up. <laughs> because there's definitely sleep, a difference. Be the same. Really? Yeah, there's, there's a difference. I think it might be more also at a metaphysical level as well. The lucid dreaming connection. Interesting. Okay. Well, I just discovered an article from the American Psychological Association, so I will have to read this. But they are saying they propose three hypotheses. One is REM sleep shows a close coordination of the electrical manifestations of activity of the two hemispheres, higher EEG coherence for selected frequencies, as a result, during atmospheric EEG coherence during the practice of meditation. Hmm. Oh, it actually allows you to meditate better. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting study, but I, again, I got to find eight hours of my day. As to where do you meditate. find eight hours to do this? So now I'm just jealous for those who have eight hours. I, I, very, I bet you that I don't know who. I mean, well, I'm sure there are people listening to the podcast that do have eight hours. And if you do, you should like to know that it's shown, the results are shown to um, 
Results show a downregulation of genes that have been implicated in inflammation. Affected genes include pro-inflammatory genes, RIPK2 and COX2, as well as several histone ugh, HADAC <laughs> genes, which regulate the activity of other genes, epigenic, epigenic the, genetically. Ugh, thank you. By removing a type of chemical tag. What all this means is it makes you capable of fighting androids when the end times come. <laughs> makes you capable of fighting androids? That's funny. That's, that's correct. <laughs> that is funny. So enjoy the world that I will give you because mm-hmm. I was not able to meditate for eight hours of the day. But... This really does remind me, though, that I need to meditate. I mean, it does, even, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's really good for, for your body and your soul and... So, so, so Jennifer, I've never meditated before. How, how do you meditate? Well, I have a little, um, like a pillow. It's called a zafu that you sit on and you keep your back upright. And I just kind of, sometimes I'll, I'll do music, like a light kind of like sleep type music, but it's called meditation music. And I close my eyes and I rest my hands on my knees and, and I just quiet my mind and, and try not to think of anything. And that's what is a challenge to me. But after I do it, I feel fabulous and just so refreshed and, uh, and peaceful. So it really, it really, and also answers will kind of come to you if you have questions about things and ideas might come to you. And, um, so yeah, it's definitely just kind of like a way to connect with your inner self or higher self maybe is even a better way of putting it. Well, as an illustrator, I would like to say that the process in which I do illustration uh, is is kind of the same method. Um, you know, when I come out of a five hour session, I don't know where I've been. Um, I don't even know that time has transpired. Wow! I don't even know where I've been. I mean, where where I've been, like uh, mentally, like I don't know what thoughts were going through my head. It just comes out on paper. And you come back, and unfortunately, I have the worst headache of all. But, um, but yeah, four or five hours can go like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how that's different from meditation, um, if it is any. I mean, I, I'm always amazed when I could look down at a piece of paper and see something that I never imagined, and it's there in physical form. And I'm like, you know, I could get stuck constantly asking myself where where that come from but um that's you know, interesting yeah so do you do you ever write down any of your meditation thoughts or thoughts after meditation no no okay. i don't no i don't know if there's such a thing like a meditation diary or anything like that i guess you could do something like that yeah yeah because uh, another cool thing to do with just a sketch pad, and you don't even have to be an illustrator, you know, is is to sketch out your dreams. Oh, you know, wow. Once That's you wake idea. up. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's something I need to really start doing is just even keeping a dream log as well. Mm-hmm. And Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I have one more news story. And what you got? The reason I chose this is because you – were all about when we first started the show about Apple and China and how about what Apple was doing to try to get into China. And yes. so now it was just an- announced that Apple and China Mobile have set to launch the iPhone on the world's largest network. So the deal is done. It is about expected to officially be announced on December 18th alongside China Mobile China's Mobile of uh, or China Mobiles, I'm sorry, unveiling of their 4G network. So uh, the iPhone will then be available on the largest network in the world. I would not be surprised if the gold iPhone is the number one selling iPhone in China. Probably so, based upon your research and the color gold. The color, in China. yeah, mm-hmm. it's huge. I mean, I you know I could not make presentation material with any other color other than gold and red. Hmm. You know, when we were trying to go into China, wow, um, it's a crazy marketplace. And, you know, I don't know what this means for us domestic 
uh, you know, living here in domestic United States, um, where Apple is going from this point on, I mean, are we just going to be second now? Because China is an emerging market to Apple's eyes, and it's one that they are helping and conquering. So, but at the same time, I don't know what what's going to happen to the company. So, it says trying to here, do so, it says here that if China Mobile launches the iPhone. To coincide with the unveiling of its 4G network next month and starts off by selling one, an additional 1.5 million iPhones every month, the carrier could end up with about 20 million additional iPhone activations in 2014. So that's, that's what crazy. they're expecting for China Mobile. So that's, that's huge. Yeah. Amazon, Apple had better have some data storage yeah. because Some, those uh, Chinese, man, they consume their data yeah. like no other. Good point. But then at, at, at the same point, or at the same time, it's exciting because does that mean that United States content creators can finally reach a Chinese market? Um, before, we can't, you know. We have to go through stringent um, protocols to release content in China. I mean, the Chinese government basically has to approve everything that goes into their country. Oh, yeah, they right. censor it. Mm -hmm. So does this mean that any any artist is capable now via iTunes to distributing content to China? If so, that's a great thing for artists mm -hmm. and content creators out there. Well, I would think that they would have their own market, their own iTunes. You know, like um, our friends in Australia... Uh, shout out to to those guys, Brad and and Vin, my friends out there. Anyway, they always hi, Brad, <laughs> and they always complain about how things will be available in you know the in uh, the U.S. version of iTunes versus the Australia version, and same with a lot of things. You know, same with Amazon. Like their Australian version of Amazon is a joke. Um, they mm. uh, it's, all they have are books, and that's it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, there's nothing else. But uh Well, podcasters such as ourselves, I mean, we, we should do well in China, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'd be at the top of the charts in China. So Jennifer, do you know any Chinese? Because I sure don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Sadly. We're gonna have to not. find someone to to uh convert this episode into Chinese. Yeah. I have a friend who's Chinese. I could ask him, but I don't think There you have it. it. I don't think he'll do it. Oh. He might. He's, yeah. he's Talos Sui from the Icon Factory. He's Chinese. He's from, he's from China. Oh, he works for Icon Factory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I love his work. Is he a designer there? He's one of the um, one of the co-owners of it. Oh, um, wow. And he does do some designing. Yeah. I, yeah, they're known for their design work. Mm -hmm. Awesome icons. He makes icons, yeah. And Very some other cool. Things too. Yeah. Wow. Is he listening to the show? I don't know, but I can tell him that he's been mentioned in the show, and I'm sure he'll listen. So yeah, I'll, I'll shoot him a message after the show's over. I, yeah, they've done some great. I mean, that's one of my inspiration links. The Icon morning. Factory. Oh yeah. No kidding. Definitely. Yeah. Well, wow, they're awesome. They're awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. Great illustration work. And even their uh, their apps are, are fantastic. You know. Oh yeah, hands yeah. down, great great group of engineers. But you know, you kind of have both. You have to have both in this day and age, and yeah, uh, they're definitely hand hand, following. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're definitely following the Apple model, which makes them so exciting. Yeah. But very cool. Yeah. Well, you're connected. No, no, I just, just, just friends with <laughs> with him. He's a super nice guy, and um, yeah. we met on MySpace years ago, and we live in the same town. So, but uh, oh wow, yeah, he's uh, years ago, he, and he I, he was the first person to tell me about Twitter. He's like, you're. You check this out, and and then they made Twitterific, you know, and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That I was, I own that app. Yeah, yeah, me too. I love Twitterific. It's beautiful. App. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we just gave him a big shout out. So yeah, hopefully and, yeah, good listening. plug for the Icon Factory. If you guys don't have Twitterific, be sure to go download it. It's for iOS. Yeah. <laughs> Well, iPhone in, in China is exciting, but at the same time, you know, it's discouraging to hear that there are several iTunes marketplaces for each individual country. I mean, we're supposed to be in the, this, this exciting age of, of openness, of democracy for everyone, and instead it just feels like the exact opposite. And, you know, Nelson Mandela passed away. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, it's yeah. very sad. But had he lived today and tried to do what he did in in the seventies, uh, that he would have never even lasted. He, I mean, he would not last in the nation state or security state that we're in today. It just would not have happened. He would have been silenced before he could even go viral. And that's just what's so discouraging is that, you know, we need a way for content to break these barriers. We don't need silos to house content for varying nations. You know, and it's true for content of all sorts, gaming, illustration, poetry, writing, anything, you name it. There are multiple silos for for content. It's just it drives me crazy and just needs and that's what IRC IRC unfortunately is is <laughs> IRC and and um a peer to peer is probably the only way for you to engage um with multiple listening audiences of varying countries and it's still discouraging that we have to rely on these super antiquated protocols when yeah you're when, you know, right yeah Everything should be open anyways. It but, should all be open. And yeah. I don't understand why there's so much control. Why not just be and add? It's disheartening. <laughs> but exciting at the same time because yeah, yeah. maybe maybe iTunes could be hacked and then something good can happen. <laughs> I mean, we I did, I did have a harsh stance against hackers. But you know, maybe, maybe it's unavoidable. Maybe hacking is is the byproduct of what's happening in today's society. Yeah. And if it, that's it is. true, then you know, I don't want to, I don't want to discourage the practice because it's a natural form of of. Um, it's just a natural form of. Well, at that point, it's, it's kind of evolutionary. Rebellion, you know, yeah. where it's. Um, yeah, it's just really not not just going with the norm and not just th- taking it and making change is, you know, hackers actually yeah. make change. Yeah. And that, that was your point, uh, in one of our previous episodes. And I don't know, I, I listened to it again and didn't really like my stance. I, I felt like I had to revise it because, you know, it might be the only way to distribute content to everybody is through setting up these black market streams. Mm -hmm. If that's what needs to happen, then so be it. But the content needs to be free and open for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We should be able to see the the full thing and the full picture and not just what they want to show us. Yeah. So, well, on that note, (laughs) we're, we're about to talk about an ice storm because that's what's happening to me. Um, it's about to but, happen here too. I think the whole nation right now is experiencing this for the most part. So. Yeah, but but you know we're talking about uh, bridging the divide, but unfortunately, an ice storm just just divides us even more mm-hmm. because uh, natural events such as ice storm, tornadoes, hurricanes, for that matter, um, cause internet uh, to be lost and. Without any internet or without any electricity, there's no internet. Without the internet, there's no data to be consumed or shared. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty much reading a book yeah. <laughs> or a comic book. Unless you prepare and you have some other ways to, but the internet still, it's, you know, if that goes that, out, yeah, you're kind of screwed. You're... <laughs> that's right. So what I would like to discuss in this, in this segment is how to prepare for an ice storm or hurricane for that matter. Um, okay. but, but the, but the ice storm or the, the temperature drop does pose some challenges for your, um, it's for okay. your devices, equipment. Yeah. So I, I wanted, I wanted to draw the delineation between an ice storm and a hurricane. And then the ice storm does pose some, uh, interesting issues. Yeah, it does. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So, so we came up with various steps um, for, for to prepare. Um, and I, Jennifer, let let's let you go first, ladies first. Okay. And um, I, you know, I numbered my my items, but they aren't. They're all relevant, and 
one is not more important than the other. So feel free and okay. jump around or well, whatever. Okay, wonderful. Well, actually, let me start with power tips. So, um, you know, one of the first things, of course, you want to do when you are going to be confronted with a storm is make certain that you have some power in case your power goes out. So um, one thing I recommend is having a generator, uh, you know, but if you don't have the money to buy a generator, some other things you might be interested in, um, hybrid owners, I don't know if you can do this with your car. You might be able to. But with the hybrid, you can use the hybrid's battery as a generator during a power outage. And it's really quite cool. There's um, some links. uh, Actually, we have a link that we'll put in the show notes about uh, how to do this. And you want to obtain a 1,000-watt inverter and connect the inverter to the hybrid. And there is um, a tutorial on how to do that. Actually, that's a... That's a great point. Uh, EV owners can turn their uh, EV vehicle into a generator, and we don't need an inverter. Um, oh, nice. I actually have a power station uh, connected in my garage, and that's I believe that's a 210 watt power station for my car, and uh, that alone acts as the uh, the inverter. I guess. No is, kidding. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, I haven't tried it yet, obviously, but in yep. the in the event of a power outage, I could just turn on my car. Yeah. And I believe my Russian friend and I, we talked about it and he came up with the numbers and my car is capable of generating maybe one one full day of, of power in my house. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Hopefully you won't need it for more than that. Hopefully not, but... Yeah like I'm stuck in ice and it's been three days. So. Yeah. Gosh, you're so lucky it stayed on. Yeah. So, um, well, when it comes to, you know, powering your home, you also want to power your devices. And, um, so let's say you don't have any of these solutions for home, but at least you can get, uh, some devices like a hand crank charger, which is a hand winding, uh, generator that charges your smartphone via USB. And one of them is called SOS Charger, uh, and that's soscharger.com. And another one is called Pocket Socket, and it does the same thing where you wind it up and it generates your device. So that's that something is good to keep a on hand. Great, great gadget to just have on hand in it case is. in case of an event like this. And there's actually one that I have in my cart currently. I haven't p- pushed the buy button yet but this just makes me want to do it it's not only a hand crank charger but it's a hand crank radio as well oh that's great yeah yeah it's an all-in-one that's great. and it's it's for about 65 dollars, and i believe uh, sharper image has it on their website but you could probably order it on amazon as well but this is a cool device i think actually i will want to own one of these yeah i think it's good to get you know i ordered the sos charger uh over the summer and i'm oh, still okay. waiting for it to come out actually it doesn't come out until february 2014 oh. it was a like a kickstarter project or something of that nature and either kickstarter or indie go go one i forgot which one but uh so i'm still waiting for it and um yeah (laughs) okay well this item that i'm talking about is out it's the weather alert emergency hand crank radio and it also serves as a charging station for your iphone Mm -hmm. but i highly suggest a weather radio no matter what the event i have one um but, you know, the NOAA signal is always going out when you're within range. Um, so it's always good to have both. All, although the, uh, it's also powered by one AAA battery. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure. Um, the ultimate test, obviously, is to test it without the battery. But, you know, this that's a interesting item. So is there any, in, do you have any idea when the SOS charger is going to be released or? Uh, it said February, 2014. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm going to have to look elsewhere, obviously, because I'm looking for one right now, but so you also have well, the pocket socket. So, well, and well, yeah, but weren't you mentioning the, the radio? Cause there's one called the best emergency radio. Um, okay. is that the one you were talking about? 
this is through Sharper Image. I don't know if there's okay. it's their own. And this one brand. is from Hamacher Schlemmer. <laughs> okay. And uh, it sells for sixty dollars, and it's a um, a crank radio, and um, I think it also charges as well. It charges your cell phone as well. Yeah. So it looks like there's a few of them out there. Um, Definitely cool, and yeah. they're under a hundred dollars. So I don't see why there's any reason for people exactly. not to own one of these. Even to go when you're camping, you know, to, that way you're yeah. in a tent and you don't have power. Or you could just you know just wind it up, and um, yeah, it's it's built for a USB charger. It also has an LED flashlight, and so it has some some really cool items on it. So yeah, 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 definitely. Well, since you you went the hand crank route. I went the solar route. Oh yeah, so let let me hear about your solar route. Okay, so my my idea, I'm glad you brought up the hand crank devices, but my idea was, you know, these small devices they consume very little electricity when you compare it to, you know, your entire electric consumption rate in the home. Um, so they should be fairly easy to charge, and that's why I was thinking solar. And it turns out that there there are some interesting uh, solar options available for you to charge your gadgets. My favorite is the Goal Zero Nomad 13 solar panel. Okay, Ooh, that sounds kind of cool. So it's at it's kind of steep in price, one hundred and forty nine ninety five. But what's most interesting about this this device is that it's a solar cell which opens up. It allows you to right out of the box charge your cell phone, tablet, or the, nice. they even have satellite phone here. But I don't know who uses the satellite this phone. This is so cool. Okay, the coolest feature about this device is that you can chain the solar cells together. Huh, so you could just get multiple uh, exactly. ones and put them together and make a bigger... That's really neat. You can chain up to four. That's okay? really neat. And so I did the numbers. Chaining four of these Nomad 13 units on their website, and we'll post this on the show notes, com- it, it combined provides you a total of 52 watts. Mm-hmm. That's enough to charge your MacBook Air. And that's neat. That the MacBook neat. Air requires 52 watts, but actually the the charger that comes with it uh, um, charges under 45 watts. So this should be sufficient for your MacBook Air laptop. So how does this work if you are if it's a cloudy day? Right, it doesn't work on a cloudy day. Okay, um, so it has to be pure sunshine. So that's that's when you charge. And I have a solar cell. On my EV, and Jennifer, do you have the hybrid option with solar cell? It doesn't have solar, no. Okay, so the solar cell, um, it's great when it is sunny. Not, of course, not when it's cloudy. But normally, it's more sunny than it is cloudy. Um, so, like for example, just recently, I didn't, I didn't know that my solar cell on my vehicle actually charges the vehicle when I park out in sunlight. And that's exactly the way it did. That's neat. Yeah. So there's yet another way to charge my vehicle. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, when you look at the solar cell on my Nissan Leaf, it's very small in size, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But it's enough to power all my electrical devices inside the car. And that's what it's primarily used for is used to charge all the electronics in the vehicle. Um, So, so, you know, looking at the Goal Zero Nomad, I'm thinking, you know, if it's a weather, if, if it's a sunny day, you just set these these panels outside and then close it. It has a nice, it's nicely designed to be folded, kind of like a briefcase, mm-hmm. and um, just wait for that emergency. That's really cool. Very very good tip. Yeah. Like so. It. Yeah, but the, it's a little steep in price when you start looking at buying four, but still, you know, um, it's it's an option. It's a really good option for your laptop. Yeah, so. that is really good. So on, on top of that, you know, I was also thinking of water because in this ice storm, at least in the Dallas area, we have people that are still out of, out of electricity, so they not, have no way of powering their water. And again... 
bringing up my Russian friend, he actually has his house um, solar. He has solar panels on on his house. Um, And he told me that it wasn't expensive anymore or as expensive as it used to be. And so I started looking at the price. And when you put everything in in context, uh, you could be looking at around $3,000 to to act to install a passive solar water heater in your house. Hmm. And that's that's not a seat price considering mm-hmm. it's no. passive. Right? That's really great. What a yes. good find. So you can always be on the cautious side and have an active solar water heater. There are two sorts, but just know that the active is going to require electricity and the passive isn't. Okay. But this is really great just especially during these times when you know, the, the power does go off. So at least you'll have hot water and can take a shower by candlelight. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Take a shower by candlelight. <laughs> um, there's still the matter of how to heat your food. And that's when, you know, I, I came into, or I investigated into propane as being an option. Um, I even discovered some propane, propane, uh, heating units for inside the house. But my first thought was smell. And sure enough, that was one thing people were complaining about was odor. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to always be careful. One, one, uh, item or one piece of advice that the news outlet has had recently was making sure that you have just, a a grill outside so you can at least grill your food. Oh yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. But still me look, I, my whole reasoning behind the solar route was to find renewable resources, mm-hmm. ways to create energy all the time in case, you know, you ro- you don't have batteries or you don't have propane. No, that's a good, a good so. solution. I really like it a lot. Yeah. What else do you have on your list? So I have um, some data backup items. So let's say you are in a you know bad storm, or or also just even um, you know maybe it's a hurricane, something you know whatever it is. You want to make certain that your data is backed up. So it's a great tip. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so some of the things that I recommend personally is you want to do first of all an on-site backup. Yeah, well, that's where you can back up to an external hard drive or an external drive connected to your device or your computer. Um, also an off-site backup. So um, one of the things, I think Steve Gibson does this uh, from Security Now. Mm-hmm. He will create, actually, a, a, he takes everything off his hard drive and makes a copy of it on, I believe, a DVD or something of that nature and mails it to his mother. And so he does that, uh, and she keeps it at her place. And uh, so he has a site or you know a copy of everything off site. And he, so in, in lieu of an ice storm, however, the postal service is closed. So no, you yeah, can't, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, you and off site, uh, what Steve Gibson, yeah, mailing it to your grandmother is always the best way. And on site is is a great way. But I used to to monitor um computers and um i had an own my own network that i was maintaining Mm -hmm. and that usually involved me going to these on-site facilities and i can just tell you via experience that's the on-site facility that i'm afraid of the most in the event of an ice storm do you mean on-site facilities such as a cloud backup Yes. Oh, no kidding. I guess because yeah. they could go out as well. And then, so my, my other suggestion was to have a cloud backup, like a, perform a nightly cloud backup of your files to, you know, um, Dropbox, Carbonite, Mosey, SOS Online, or something like you know, Box, whatever. Um, right. Yeah. But so you I would, were... Apple, Apple, Amazon, you have to go with the big names when you're thinking about offsite. Everybody else is vulnerable. Vulnerable. I mean, because when it comes to weather events, the people that actually test to make sure that their backup systems uh, work as intended are the people with the most money that can afford the testing. Mm-hmm. Good point. And I've I've seen it happen so many times through companies I will not mention um, that they just simply do not have the money um they're more interested in getting subscribers but when it comes to um actually doing 
um, testing on their backup systems. They they don't spend any money in that area. Hmm. And so you can see yourself getting burned. Um, I go through Box.net, who I think their cloud servers are Amazon, AWS. Okay. So just just you know with with whoever company you decide to uh do your offsite backup I would see where their data center is actually like what part of the country is it Yeah that's a good suggestion Yeah Yeah very smart Yeah So that was those were my next set of tips I have some more tips too but that's uh data backup I think is important especially when it comes to store and preparedness Definitely definitely um yeah, you know, I have box.net, so yeah, my beta is backed up whenever I add. Um, but I have redundancy upon redundancy. Of, I've lost my computer so many times, I can't even tell you. So, um, but the Apple iCloud is, I think, the best way to make sure that, or Google for that matter, and it's, um, um, I believe it's Google, Google Plus Drive. service. Yeah, Google Drive mm-hmm. is the best way to store data. Just your contact list. Um, yeah, I have everything stored yeah. in Google, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, iCloud, too. I do both. But. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's the biggest companies that I think are the most reliable. Yeah. Good yeah. Good point. Very good point. Well, uh, my my item or my 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 precautionary note is not to be too quick to power up tech uh, outside um that to me is is something you can do um that to me is the best preventative measure um in operating machinery in tech is or in cold weathers is not even to operate it um i had this one problem where i was i was doing a camera shoot for a client it was 12 degrees outside i had brought my canon 40d and the cam the camera refused to come on oh wow but i was able to take the photos i needed because i was in a remote location with my iphone Mm -hmm. so i learned yeah i learned firsthand that you know this powerful equipment will not work in you know 26 and below um temperatures whereas my iphone did it was the most reliable interesting that's so, a good tip yeah we i included uh in our show notes you'll have the link to tech hive and that pretty much does a rundown of um gadgets and what the what the temperature was for the testing mm-hmm. and um they said a great note that to take away from this article is that the cheaper is the better when operating devices in frigid temperatures. Interesting. Frigid climates. Yeah. Interesting. So the Galaxy S2 didn't shut down until the temperature reached negative 31 degrees. That's wow. great to know. Yeah. That is, yeah. that's uh, pretty cold. Definitely cold, but we have some negative temperatures here in the United States. So uh, it's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, most smartphones, they say, um, they couldn't handle temperatures. They cannot handle temperatures ranging from about five degrees down to four degrees. See, I've never even had to try that because it never gets cold here. It's always, I don't know. I mean, I get in the twenties on occasion, but that's about it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. They say here that lowering the temperature to 14 degrees was more than an iPhone could handle, even though mine did. But maybe it's because I kept it in my pocket. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, they said that the, the the biggest problem with, with frigid climates or t- with cold temperatures is that pieces of the equipment actually begin failing. So f- so your AMOLED displays and, um, uh, in my case, uh, headphones start to die. Um, so yeah, just various parts of the smartphone begin to fail on you. Yeah. So yeah, that's just something to be aware of. Um, when you know that ice is about to hit, make sure you know the temperature, Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you're going to be at, uh, because that pretty much determines what your options are, um, for preventative measures, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Good point. Very good. Well, um, I have um, some smart device tips and apps to 
that I think are good to have just in case of a, um, a disaster or a bad storm. So, um, the first one is emergency text alerts. You want to make certain that you are subscribed to those. So Google, for example, has Google public alerts and they do work as I have been noticing public alerts come through on my Android device uh, since I am subscribed to them, uh, notifying me that there is definitely an ice storm in effect right now. Um, do you also have your phone uh provide amber alerts as well is that part of the service it, that uh, mine does that by default but i could have turned that off if i wanted to but that is one of the alerts it does do yeah cool yeah my mine does that as well but yeah. i also have a cool weather app um that i installed that actually gives me the no weather radio feed or whatever you can actually uh place the location or the code the weather code mm -hmm. into into the app and it'll actually give you the NOAA weather stream oh, neat. which is really cool that is cool and that 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 was what i had on uh during my tornado during the tornado outbreak outbreak mm -hmm. a few years ago interesting i yeah. i'll have to check that out um yeah. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, yes, yeah, I see you have some banking apps here too, which is cool. Yeah, I have. Well, for the weather, I some of the other ones that I had recommended um, or that I have recommended uh -huh. are uh, AccuWeather always does a really good. That's job. a good one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Disaster alerts um, by the Pacific Disaster Center. Um, Google Public Alerts. I already mentioned them. Hurricane. So, in case for hurricane, is an app put out by American Red Cross. Fantastic. Um, Storm Shields is another one by Scripps Media. And that's cost four ninety nine. Uh, there's an, uh, an app called Tornado uh, by the American Red Cross as well. Um, Weathertron is another good one by Keening Labs and Yahoo Weather. I'm throwing that into the mix because they did recently come out with a beautiful weather app. <laughs> um, oh, very cool! Yeah, I have to check that out. So, um, so in addition, there's also. Um, Banking apps is what I recommend. You know, it's that way if you are caught in a storm, uh, it, the power goes out, but you need to do something, maybe pay a bill or do something, maybe move, move some funds around. If you have a banking app, your bank um, on your phone, that definitely is helpful. Um, same with insurance apps. You know, if you want to have your insurance company on there, so that way you can process claims, do what you need to do, uh, just in case you don't have access to a desktop computer or a laptop, that way you can access it on your phone. Um, wait, 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 wait. What's this? I'm seeing that Sprint has some service for filing claims. Oh, no. Um, no service for what oh, you're reading okay. is because I have a Sprint phone, so I mentioned Sprint Smart Device. Um, oh, <laughs> so gotcha, no, 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 gotcha. Yeah. I was like, man, that'd be a great That would great be kind of cool, app. right? <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Um, another one are emergency services apps. Um, so, and maybe some medical first aid. So I have some medical first aid apps that mm. I recommend as well. Um, one of them, I'm going to mention my favorite one first, pet first aid. <laughs> so, you know, like whenever something happens to your, your dog or your cat or your bird or whatever the pet is, you know, do you really know what to do? I don't know what to do. And so there is a first aid app by Jive Media and it's called Pet First Aid. <laughs> so, I am downloading right now. Yeah, it's definitely, a, a, I have that um, on my device and I really like it. Unfortunately, I haven't had to use it. Um, then there's uh, the Army has a first aid one called Army First Aid, um, which is pretty cool. Um, Ooh, is it free? That one is one ninety nine, but there is a free American Red Cross one called First Aid. Um, also, ICE uh, for in case of emergency. There's a few fr uh, free apps for that, and there's also some paid ones. Um, Health Hotlines is another good one. It's by the National Library of Medicine. And Wiser is also a great one. It's by the National Library of Medicine. Also, there's a Pocket First Aid and CPR one as well by Jive Media. Mm. So um, along those same... See, my, my wife was also... She was licensed or she's certified in CPR. And maybe that's a good idea is to become certified yeah. prior to these 
events, it's always good to have someone in the house that's certified as CPR. Right. And especially because if you're stuck in an ice storm and something happens to one of your loved ones, you know, you can't, you don't you're have the access, only one. <laughs> right? There's that's no one right. who's going to help, right? So yeah. if you can maybe refer to these guides or have someone else in the home that's certified in CPR, um, mm-hmm. that definitely is helpful. Um yeah. There's also another another cool one. It's called the Survival Guide, and I have that on my phone. It's um, SAS Survival Guide by uh, Trellis uh, Net, Trellis dot Net, and it's that costs five ninety nine. But it's it's a sweet guide. It's a sweet survival guide. Fortunately, I haven't had to use it, but um, you know. I see there's a light version as well. It's free. Oh, there is a light version. I oh, I haven't tried that one, so that might yeah. be worth giving it a shot. So in lieu of a zombie apocalypse, I will be armed with the SAS survival guide. <laughs> Who cares funny. about ads when zombies are approaching? Yeah, ads, that's nothing. You steal that's my right. data. I don't care. The zombies are coming, so <laughs> that's right. I got to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, FEMA has a survival guide. It's a shelter and a survival guide. Um mm-hmm. And then the Red Cross also has a shelter. It's called Red Cross Shelter View. So in situations where you do need to find a shelter, um, that app by Red Cross will guide you to the nearest shelter in your area. You know what? That's a great point because I live out in in the country. I'm sure I mentioned that before, but uh, I don't know where the shelters are close to me or where the shelter centers are. And the news kind of alluded or my local news alluded to shelters being present but they didn't give us the locations Mm -hmm. they just said that shelters will be open but i don't know where they are (laughs) so yeah so that would be good for you just to even just see where where the nearby shelters are just in case exactly i'm downloading the app right now (laughs) (laughs) um Flashlights are always a good app, but you know, with the latest phones, all of them are pretty much have flashlights anyway, right? I mean, yeah. the new with iOS 7, you have the flashlight app, and right. that's already built into it. And Android phones have it, but in case you don't, a good one is called Flashlight O, and then there's mm-hmm. another one called Flashlight SOS Flash Text. And um, they're not stealing any of my data, they, right? I don't know if that, I'm not saying that they're stealing your data or not, I don't think they are. But who knows, right? I think you're going to have to be 100% sure that they're not stealing your data before I download this flashlight app. I've downloaded Same. them, but I don't know if you're stealing my data. So. Okay. I'll wait for you to try it out. Okay, I'll let you know if, if, I, if anything funky happens. Um, also recommended are scanner apps. So, you know, maybe installing a police scanner app to your iPhone or your Android device that way you can hear what's going on in the area. Um, I have those. You have them? Mm-hmm. Oh, no kidding. They are very cool. Actually, during during um, news events, like as, as it's unfolding, uh, what was that one event that transpired in L.A. where the, the cop killer was running around? Um. He killed several se- several LAPD officers. Um, tried to go for the commissioner or something. Mm. It was a pretty wild deal, and then ended up uh, killing himself by burning a house down. Oh wow! I don't remember that. Well, I was I was listening to the whole thing on their police scanners. Oh neat! Even where you yeah. are, you were listening. Mm-hmm. They had it. Wow. Yeah, it's all online. You can tap into these streams through these radio. Streams you can uh, in Denton uh, close to me. I can listen to the fire department, police. It's kind of all of one frequency, so you can pretty much listen to all the first responders. That's um, in cool. Dallas, they're separate uh, frequencies, but yeah, in during an ice storm, that would be the stream to be listening to yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. And, and some of the ones that I, that I have re- recommend that I've kind of checked out, um, uh, was one called five, five dash O five, five dash O radio police scanner. There's a light okay. version and then there's a paid version. Very um, cool. Then there's also police scanner and police scanner plus and police scanner pro. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's there's quite a few different ones. Police Scanner Pro is the most expensive. It's four ninety nine, um, versus some of those others are free or they're only a dollar ninety nine. Does Police Scanner work when I'm on the highway? Oh, that's a good question. It should. I don't see why I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm downloading it right now. <laughs> and- yeah, there. I was I, I just brought it up because I was on the highway and this Mercedes in front of me put on her brakes and sure enough there was a cop like right down like not too far away. So I knew I knew that she had to kind of be in tune with where the policemen were stationed oh. for their speed speed trap. Um so it's always nice to know that there could be possible apps out there. Yeah. Anything that can help you um not get a ticket. You know, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not suggesting that people install these on their own devices, but I'm just saying if if you're bored and want to know yeah. where the policemen are, yeah, I think it'd be so fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, I recommend in, in just in case something bad happens, um, location apps so that you know where you or not you you know where you are, but you know where your loved ones are. So first, you know, of course, if your family is using Find Friends, Find Friends with by Apple is always a great app to to make certain you mm-hmm. have powered up and, and running, and so you can check uh, check them out and see where they are. Um, another one is called Reunite by the National Library of Medicine. It is free and it is um, purpose is to find your loved ones and people that you know in terms in in the event of a bad storm or something horrible happening you know um it's great and then life 360 family locator that's free that's another one and then um you know and there's a lot of other ones that that are out there as well no i i think i think the i was looking for apps and you found them so that's great um my the app that i suggest is one you know being an iphone owner is one that already comes on every iPhone. It's pre-installed, and that's Find My iPhone. Oh, yeah, Find My iPhone, definitely. Yeah, just have that turned on because it's not just you that is able to find your iPhone, but it's everybody else. Um, Police, policemen, first responders, they have – I don't know if they have direct access to this information, but I know that they can. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a good way of, you know, if you're stuck, you don't know where you are, uh, as long as you have your device and it's working, um, they they can easily triangulate your position. Yeah, that's a good idea. You're right. Everyone needs to make certain that they're on. I think a lot of people do not, you know, so have it on by default and they, they don't know and they don't, you know, really look into it. But that's a great app and it really, yeah. really helps. I can't tell you how many people I've talked with that have lost their phones and not had that on and not never yeah. enabled it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate that it's not enabled by default. Is it? I, I thought it was, but I guess it isn't. Oh, well, it's actually part of the installation process of iOS. Do you want find my iPhone on? Yeah, I think it is. Do you want to enable iCloud services? And that's just oh, one that's of them. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely have it on, especially on the 5S with the fingerprint reader or scanner. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it it complements the fingerprint scanner so well because uh, with Find My iPhone on and the fingerprint scanner, they at least know that you are who you say you are. Yeah, good point. That so makes sense. Yeah. I have a few more items. Should Which items? Which Should more? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Definitely. I have an emergency supply list that I made. Okay. Ooh. All right. So some things to prepare in case you know that the power is going to go out or there's a bad storm or whatever. But um, you want water, at least one gallon per person per day for at least three days. Okay. Uh, food, of course. That's that's a no-brainer. Um, Can I stop with the water real quick? Huh? Yeah. So I, I was, I'm planning on, well, I've been planning and I haven't purchased it because I'm not really sure how to keep this fret, this water fresh, but they suggest to have an emergency supply of water. And I've been looking at five gallon tanks, but at what point does the water become tainted? Well, 
I, you know, I mean, I would think that it would be be fresh for at least. I mean, I think the shelf life of water is pretty long. I mean, maybe after a couple of years, then it might not be good anymore, or you know. But well, that's that's just if water was water. But here, I I don't know about where you are, but they're doing heavy fracking where I am. So and other things. I mean, who knows what else they're doing? They're doing natural gas drilling and mm-hmm. oil drilling and all that stuff. Um, I don't think water is good after a certain period of time. And I think the, the, the idea is to, uh, still have an emergency supply of bottled water and not. Yeah. Bottled water. Yeah, yeah. definitely bottled water. And, uh, you know, even any of those little filters, right? Like I have this, um, Filter's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Like any, especially like, I'll, I'll throw this company out, Santevia.com, S-A-N-T-E-V-I-A.com. They make, um, you know, different pitchers and things that you can put in your water bottle and it brings the alkalinity up and it brings the pH level to 9.5, which is an ideal pH for your water. And it really helps to raise the alkalinity of your, of yourself, raise your body's pH, make you um, less acidic and eliminate disease. So and along with meditation, you can become Superman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm leaving out. That's why I'm not Superwoman yet, is because that's I don't right. meditate like I should. Darn it. So, so there's water filtering is a great idea. What else do you have on your list? Uh, of course, the food, um, the flashlight, and extra batteries. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you also want a first aid kit. Um, Always essential. Yep. A whistle is a good idea. Uh, mm-hmm. Moist toilets and some garbage bags and plastic ties. Toilet paper. Toilet paper is good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, wrench or pliers in case you need to mess with any utilities. Um, can opener if you have canned food. <laughs> yes, I have read the book Alas Babylon and the can opener is definitely, I have learned, the most essential I mean, item I guess to you're, possess. You're screwed if you don't have the can opener, I guess. That's, right? That is correct. Yeah. Um, some local maps. Uh, so, you know, if in case you don't actually have um, any devices working, you know, you can't rely upon Google Maps or Apple Maps. So some actual paper maps would be good to have. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Prescription medications and glasses and contacts. Make certain you have those in a safe place if you do rely upon those items. Uh, of course, if you have babies, infant formula and diapers, um, don't forget about the pet food and the extra water for your wonderful pets. That is a great point. Mm-hmm. Um, documents such as your insurance policies, bank records, put them in a waterproof container. Um, I was actually looking at a waterproof safe the other day, just in case and, um, you know, waterproof and fireproof safe. I think that's a good idea. That's a great suggestion. Um, cash and traveler's checks. Cash is huge. Yeah. Cash is important because if power is out and it's out, you know, around where you are, um, people aren't probably aren't going to be able to take your debit card. And that uh, is correct. Yeah. And then if you need a barter, uh, cash is probably good in those situations as well. Mm -hmm. So when currency does become valid again, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i've been watching too much walking dead good one uh, yeah i haven't watched but... walking dead and i still thought that was funny so <laughs> um just you so. can also burn it as well it's a heat <laughs> <You> source <laughs> keep for heat <laughs> um of course you want a first aid book so if the app on your phone isn't working because your battery is dead then you know you can use a first aid book sleeping bags and warm blankets um changes of clothes and Mm -hmm. fire extinguisher just in case um that's interesting matches in a waterproof container um and some personal hygiene items paper cups plates towels you know utensils yeah uh, paper and pencil and books games puzzles of stuff like that for kids so if you have children to keep them occupied since they can't watch tv they can play with puzzles games and books 
Yeah, so I was reading the paper this morning, and there are some Dallas residents without power. I've I've said this in the episode, and one of them, it was interesting because they said heat was probably their first concern, and boredom was their second. <laughs> boredom. <laughs> That's there was funny. no TV to watch. There was nothing to do oh, but gosh. a good book. But unfortunately, they could not read at night. So oh, yeah. Well, had they had a Nook or a Kindle device, they would be able to read. And the e-ink display is just, just a great, great, tough, yeah. sturdy device for these events. Good idea. Yeah. So my wife and I are both equipped with Nooks, so we probably would have been... Happily entertained, yeah. and especially if the if the books are downloaded to your device already, then, exactly. Yeah, and you have the hand crank charger. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so, don't leave home without it. But I just feel more sorry for the individuals with Chromebooks and you know, uh, oh, yeah. machines that are required to have internet connectivity. Mm-hmm. You probably find very fast or real quick that uh, your device is useless. Your device is useless without the internet. Exactly. Exactly. So always something to keep in mind. But yeah, the it, it's it's funny, isn't it? How we always resort to these low tech items to stay safe. Mm-hmm. There's neat. no tech really to to help us in these situations except maybe notify first responders if that's what needs to happen but in the end it's it's down to what you have in physical form and you know mm-hmm. blankets blankets are always key not the heated kind <laughs> no no you're right yeah well speaking of books my last item on my list was the farmer's almanac oh good one yeah, so I've been looking at always, always stay mindful of what the Farmer's Almanac has to say. And it's pretty, like I suggested earlier, it's predicting snow or ice every weekend this month, whereas the weather people in your local market won't really go out on a limb and say that. Um, but it's interesting. Just I, I did a search on the origin of the Farmer's Almanac, and discovered that the formula which is used in the the predictions which kind of comes from um from natural cycles from various sources whether it be moon ocean tide whatever um is still a secret even today the formula is kept safely tucked away in a black tin box at the almanac offices in dublin new hampshire interesting a black so, tin box? Exactly. Black tin oh. box. That's right. <laughs> Very neat. Yeah. So, you know, not only is it a great way of of, of forecasting the weather, um, and anybody can go to farmersalnac.com and get their 2013 or 2014 edition. Um, but it's also a great time capsule, too. Um, well. I'll tell you what I'm reading right now, what's coming into North Carolina, and it sounds horrible. It's yeah. just we rain. We predicted this rain, when... There's, the hard, there's no snow. We oh. predicted this because the solar solar activity has amped up. It started again, and normally that means for weird uh, weather patterns. Hmm. So. It is interesting, though, that what they select is it's it, these predictions are for huge territories. Like I'm looking at the southeast, and that mm-hmm. incorporates um, or encompasses rather Tennessee all the way down to Florida. And you know the weather for us is way different than what it is down in Florida. You know, it's so it's yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Some of it's based on geography, and it mm-hmm. you know. It's very easy to deduce if if you're on the other side of the Rocky Mountains and it's, you know, um, storm-like, then it's obviously going to build into the plain states. Yeah. So, but that along with the moon cycles and, and all that good stuff, I think, make it in this, a fun read. And so, it said, it's still said to be 80% accurate, so... Well, there is the Farmer's Almanac 2014 U.S. edition is five ninety nine. They have it for the Kindle, the Nook, the iPad, as well as PDF format. So 
If you're interested in downloading it, definitely check it out. Highly suggest it. Yeah, very cool. So do you have anything else on your list? No, I think I covered everything. Yeah. Okay. So in the event of an ice storm, um, you should be highly prepared after after taking some of our tips. Um, unfortunately, I am not prepared at all. And <laughs> Fortunately, you still have food, a few, a little bit of food left. And we're running out power, but you are running out. So we are running out. So it's going to be down to eating ice here. Oh my in the- gosh. It's going to be crazy. Oh, we'll see. Good luck. I'm, I'll keep tabs on you. I'm being sarcastic, of course. I'm, I'm just noticing vehicles leaving the street or oh, good. driving by. So now I'm thinking, well, maybe it's my time to brave maybe it. Maybe it's now time. It's, it's, yeah, it's right. getting to the warmest time of the day almost for you. So maybe it'll be time to, for you to venture out to the nearest. What do you, What store do you have out there? Albertsons or... A Walmart, Walmart, unfortunately. Well, the Walmart is the nearest one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's going to look like Black Friday. It will be like Black Friday and <laughs> the bread and the milk will be gone. That's right. <laughs> well, and what, what do you, yeah, and eggs, right? The I, I drink almond milk, so I doubt people in oh, this area will really flock to almond milk. <laughs> That's better for you. Milk is not good for you, but almond milk is good for you. Well, yeah, I concur. I concur. But um, so... Uh, hopefully people are not snowed in and um, they have access to the internet uh, is there anything they could look be looking forward to um, as term, in terms of podcasting from you Jennifer oh from me um, yeah well on Thursday we'll be doing get nerdy with it mm-hmm. and so check out get nerdy with it.com and some of the upcoming guests um, I've agreed or I've gotten um, I don't know if you know his name is it's this guy his name is Flossie Carter and Flossie has this YouTube channel and he does reviews and his reviews are just so real and he has such a huge following too um, but they're just cool. he's he does awesome reviews so anyway so we're gonna work on getting him on the show and then on Friday we're doing tech webcast and that will be that's an Australian based podcast um, and that I'm not sure who will be the guest on that show I don't know at this point so we'll mm-hmm. see very cool well uh, our users can keep up with us uh, by su- subscribing to our Google Plus page at uh, plus tech anarchy social yeah I think it's plus yeah so google.com slash plus sign mm-hmm. tech anarchy tech, tech anarchy tech social social and, and then, then we are also located at tech anarchy podcast it's facebook.com slash tech anarchy podcast yeah facebook.com slash tech anarchy podcast as well as tech anarchy.com uh-huh tech anarchy.com and on twitter uh, we are on twitter tech underscore anarchy yes everywhere Yes, <laughs> everywhere. Hopefully we are everywhere.